This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 33 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland. Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. Part 1, Chapter 26. Hiding the Evidence. It is New Year's Eve. An air of pleasant anticipation fills the prison. Tomorrow's feast is the exciting subject of conversation. Roast beef will be served for dinner, with a goodly loaf of currant bread, and two cigars for dessert. Extra men have been drafted for the kitchen. They flit from block to yard, looking busy and important. Yet, halting every passer-by to whisper with secretive mind, Don't say I told you. Sweet potatoes tomorrow. The younger inmates seem sceptical, and strive to appear indifferent, the while they hover about the yard door, nostrils expanded, sniffing the appetizing wafts from the kitchen. Here and there an old-timer grumbles. We should have had sweet Murphys for Christmas. Too high-priced, Sandy said. They sneer in ill-humour. The new arrivals grow uneasy. Perhaps they are still too expensive. Some study the market quotations on the delicacy. But the chief cook drops in to visit his boy, and confides to the rangeman that the sweet potatoes are a sure thing, just arrived in county. The happy news is whispered about with confident assurance, yet tinged with anxiety. There is great rejoicing among the men. Only soul, the lifer, is querulous. He doesn't care a snap about the extra feet. Stomach still sour from the Christmas dinner, and anyhow it only makes the week a day grub more disgusting. The rules are somewhat relaxed. The hall men converse freely. The yard gangs lounge about and cluster in little groups that separate at the approach of a superior officer. Men from the bakery and kitchen run in and out of the block, their pockets bulging suspiciously. What are you after? The doorkeeper halts them. Oh, just my sale. Forgot my handkerchief. The guard answers the sly wink with an indulgent smile. All right, go ahead, but don't be long. If Papa Mitchell is about, he thunders at the chief cook, his bosom swelling with packages. What you got there, eh? Big family of kids you have, Jim. First thing you know, you'll wipe the hinges off the kitchen door. The envied bakery and kitchen employees supply their friends with extra holiday tidbits, and the solitaries dance in glee at the sight of the savoury dainty, the fresh brown bread generously dotted with sweet currants. It is the prelude of the promised culinary symphony. The evening is cheerful with mirth and jollity. The prisoners at first converse in whispers, then become bolder and talk louder through the bars. As night approaches, the cell house rings with unreserved hilarity and animation, light-hearted chaff mingled with coarse jests and droll humour. A wag of upper tier banters the passing guards, his quips and sallies setting the adjoining cells in roar, an inspiring imitation. Slowly the babble of tongues subsides, as the gong sounds the order to retire. Someone shouts to a distant friend, Hey Bill, are you there? Yeah, yes. Stay there. It grows quiet, when suddenly my neighbour on the left sings songs. Fellers, who's going to sit up with me to greet New Year's? A dozen voices yell their acceptance. Little Frenchy, the spirited grey head on the top tier, vociferates shrilly. Me too, boys. I'm viz you all night. All is still in the cell house, save for a wild Indian whip now and then by the vigil keeping boys. The block breathes in heavy sleep. Loud snoring sounds from the gallery above. Only the irregular thread of the felt soled guards fall muffled in the silence. The clock in the upper rotunda strikes the midnight hour. A siren on the Ohio intones its deep chested bass. Another joins it, then another. Shrill factory whistles pierce the boom of cannon. The sweet chimes of a nearby church ring in joyful melody between. Instantly the prison is astir. Tin cans rattle against iron bars. Doors shake in fury. Beds and chairs squeak and screech. Pans slam on the floor. Shoes crash against the walls with a dull thud and rebound noisily on the stone. Unearthly yelling, shouting and whistling rend the air. An inventive prisoner beats a wild tattoo 
with a pin-pan on the table a veritable bedlam of frenzy has broken loose in both wings the prisoners are celebrating the advent of the new year the voices grow hoarse and feeble the tin clanks languidly against the iron the grating of the doors sounds weaker the men are exhausted with the unwanton effort the guards stumbled up the galleries their forms swaying unsteadily in the faint flicker of the gaslight in maudlin tones they command silence and bid the men retire to bed the younger more daring challenged the order with husky howls and cat calls a defiant shout a groan and all is quiet daybreak wakes the turmoil and uproar for twenty-four hours the long repressed animal spirits are rampant no music or recreation hours honours the new year the day is passed in the cell the prisoners securely barred and locked are permitted to vent their pain and sorrow their yearnings and hopes in a saturnalia of tumult part two the month of january brings sedulous activity shops and block are overhauled every hook and corner is scarred and a special squad detailed to whitewash the sails the yearly clean-up not being due till spring i conclude from the unusual preparations that the expected visit of the board of charities is approaching the prisoners are agog with the coming investigation the solitaries and prospective witnesses are on the qui vive anxious lines on their faces some manifest fear of the ill-will of the warden as the probable result of their testimony i seek to encourage them by promising to assume full responsibility but several men withdraw their previous consent the safety of my data causes me grave concern in view of the increasing frequency of searches deliberation finally resolves itself into the bold plan of searching my most valuable material in the cell set aside for the use of the officers it is the first cell on the range it is never locked and is ignored at searches because it is not occupied by prisoners the little bundle protected with a piece of oilskin procured from the dispensary soon reposes in the depths of the waste pipe a stout cord secures it from being washed away by the rush of water when the privy is in use i call officer mitchell's attention to the dusty condition of the cell and offer to sweep it every morning and afternoon he exceeds in an off-hand manner and twice daily i surreptitiously examine the tension of the water show cord renewing the string repeatedly other material and copies of my exhibits are deposited with several trustworthy friends on the range everything is ready for the investigation and we confidently await the coming of the board of charities part three the sale house rejoices at the absence of scott woods the block captain of the morning has been reduced to the ranks the disgrace is signalized by his appearance in the wall pacing the narrow path in the chilly winter blasts the guards look upon the assignment as punishment day for incurring the displeasure of the warden the keepers smile at the indiscreet scout interfering with the self-granted privileges of southside johnny one of the warden's favorites the runner who afforded me an opportunity to see inspector nevin came out victorious in the struggle with woods the latter was upbraided by captain wright in the presence of johnny who is now officially authorized in his prerequisites sufficient time was allowed to elapse to avoid comment whereupon the officer was drawn from the block i regret his absence a severe disciplinarian woods was yet very exceptional among the guards in that he sought to discourage the spying of prisoners on each other he frowned upon the trustees and strove to treat the men impartially mitchell has been changed to the morning shift to fill the vacancy made by the transfer of woods the charge of the block in the afternoon devolves upon officer mcilvane a very corpulent man with sharp steely eyes he is considerably above the average warder in intelligence but extremely fond of jasper who now acts as his assistant the obese turnkey rarely leaving his seat at the front desk changes of keepers transfers from the shops to the two cell houses are frequent the new guards are alert and active almost daily the warden visits the ranges leaving in his wake more stringent discipline rarely do i find a chance to pause at the cells i keep in touch with the men through the medium of notes but one day several fights breaking out in the shops the block officers are requisitioned to assist in placing the combatants in the punishment cells the front is deserted and i improve the opportunity to talk to the solitaries jasper southside and bob runyon the politicians also converse at the doors 
Bob standing suspiciously close to the bars. Suddenly Officer McElvain appears in the yard door. His face is flushed, his eyes filling with wrath as they fasten on the men at the cells. Hey, you fellows, get away from there, he shouts. Confound you all, the old man just gave me the juice. Too much talking in the block. I won't stand for it, that's all, he adds petulantly. Within half an hour I am hauled before the warden. He looks worried, deep lines of anxiety about his mouth. You are reported for standing at the doors, he snarls at me. What are you always telling the men? It's the first time the officer. Nothing of the kind, he interrupts. You're always talking to the prisoners. They are in punishment, and you have no business with them. Why was I picked out? Others talk too. Yes, he drawls sarcastically. Then, turning to the keeper, he says, How is that, officer? The man is charging you with neglect of duty. I am not charging. Silence. What have you to say, Mr. McElvain? The guard reddens with suppressed rage. It isn't true, Captain, he replies. There was no one except Berkman. You hear what the officer says. You're always breaking the rules. You're plotting. I know you. You're pulling a dozen wires. You are inimical to the management of the institution but i will break your connections officers take him directly to south wing you understand he is not to return to his cell have it searched at once thoroughly lock him up warden what for i demanded i have not done anything to lose my position talking is not such a serious charge very serious very serious you're too dangerous on the range I'll spoil your infernal schemes by removing you from the North Block. You've been there too long. I want to remain there. The more reason to take you away. That will do now. No, it won't, I burst out. I'll stay where I am. Remove him, Mr. McElvain. I am taken to the south wing and locked up in a vacant cell, neglected and ill-smelling. It is number two, range M the first gallery facing the yard, a double cell, somewhat larger than those of the north block, and containing a small window. The walls are damp and bare, save for the cupboard of printed rules and the prison calendar. It is the 27th of February, 1896, but the calendar is of last year, indicating that the cell has not been occupied since the previous November. It contains the usual furnishings, bedstead and soiled straw mattress, a small table and a chair. It feels cold and dreary. In thought I picture the guards ransacking my former cell. They will not discover anything. My material is well hidden. The warden evidently suspects my plans. He fears my testimony before the investigation committee. My removal is to sever my connections, and now it is impossible for me to reach my data. I must return to North Block, otherwise all our plans are doomed to fail. I can't leave my friends on the range in the lurch. Some of them have already signified to the chaplain their desire to testify. Their statements will remain unsupported in the absence of my proofs. I must rejoin them. I have told the warden that I shall remain where I was, but he probably ignored it as an empty boast. I consider the situation and resolve to break up housekeeping. It is the sole means of being transferred to the other shell house. It will involve the loss of the grade and a trip to the dungeon, perhaps even a fight with the keepers. The guards, fearing the broken furniture will be used for defence, generally rush the prisoner with blackjacks. But my return to the north wing will be assured. No man in stripes can remain in the south wing. Alert for an approaching step, I untie my shoes, producing a scrap of paper, a pencil and a knife. I write a hurried note to Kay, briefly informing him of the new developments, and intimating that our data are safe. Guardedly, I attract the attention of the runner on the floor beneath. It is Bill Say, through whom Carl occasionally communicates with G. The note rolled into a little ball. I ship between the bars to the waiting prisoner. Now everything is prepared. It is near supper time. The men are coming back from work. It would be advisable to wait till everybody is locked in and the shop officers depart home. There will then be only three guards on duty in the block, but I am in a fever of indignation and anger. Furiously snatching up the chair, I start breaking up. End of section 33. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland. This has been a LibriVox recording. 
It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist.